Hello, and welcome to our new unit on witchcraft. So you may think of witches as the Wicked Witch in the West, or as scary creatures in horror movies, or you might know a witch or be a witch, like a neo-pagan or a Wiccan, or an Alexandrian or Gardenarian reconstructed witch, or even a fairy. Those are all things we're gonna get to later, but that's not what we're looking at today. What we're looking at today is a global phenomenon and a historical phenomenon by which misfortunes and social tensions are addressed by accusations of witchcraft. Now, by and large, the history of witchcraft and witch accusations is a history of violence, brutality, and terror. I mean, how many witches or accused witches were burned? in the West, uh, in Europe, and in the United States even. This stuff goes on today where people are accused of witchcraft and are murdered. So there's some big stakes to witchcraft. Namely, uh, it can lead to people, mostly female, being killed. But we're going to start today by looking at witchcraft amongst the Azandi. And we're going to be reading this classic book, which I encountered in my undergraduate. I still think this is what Again, one of the great things about this class is I get to assign some of my favorite books. So this book shows a system of witchcraft that you're going to become quite familiar with, to the point that you might even catch yourself thinking about witchcraft. I remember one of the first times I taught this at another university. I had a student, we were about two weeks into the unit, and she walked in and she had a cast on her foot. And I said, who hates you? And she looked at me and she went, I think it's my roommate. I'm just saying my roommate's been really cranky with me and kind of jealous and sort of mean. And this isn't the first thing that my car broke down the other day. I'm thinking, I'm thinking it's witchcraft. And I said, could be, could be. So one of the cool things about the Azandi notion of witchcraft is it's actually positive. It's a positive understanding of the world that actually reinforces good social relationships between people, as I'll get to in our lecture today. Um, and that's really intriguing because our second case study on witchcraft, I'll talk about it briefly today, will be by Dominique Favrasada, and she wrote this incredible book called Deadly Words. And in that, she shows an incredibly antisocial type of witchcraft that is more in line with how witchcraft accusations go kind of worldwide. Now, there is a problem to all this. I'm saying worldwide. There's no constant word for witchcraft in all of these cultures that speak different languages, but we see specific dynamics that we'll point to as being a, a sort of a cluster of ideas that will allow us to identify a thing as witchcraft. So my question is always, would the Azande see witchcraft accusations in India or witchcraft accusations in France with, with deadly words as being the same thing? We will see that Favrasada analyzes her witchcraft cases based uh, primarily on Evans Pritchard. This book is the definitive book on witchcraft around the world. And anyone who writes on witchcraft has to make reference to it because it's such a, a lucid, cohesive, and innovative treatment of the topic. So without further ado, welcome to the world of witchcraft. All right, I'm going to share my screen and then we'll be on our way. All right, a zombie witchcraft, a social system. So um, it looks like my subtitles aren't available. No, oh, sorry. Anyway, so magic and witchcraft, more appropriately, anti-witchcraft, is a huge part of Azandi culture. But the question remains, with all of this talk about witchcraft, are there actually any witches? Well, no, there actually aren't. So let me pause this for a second. I'm going to try to get my subtitles started. So I'll be right back. All right, we're back and we should have subtitles now. So are there witches? Well, no. By and large, when you look at all of this lore about witchcraft, you'll see that there are no actual witches doing anything. There's a lot of speculation about witches do. There's a lot of discussion about uh, secret actions of witches. But, and we're going to read actually in Evans Pritchard about all sorts of magic rituals, and we're going to read about secret societies. And there's going to be a, a speculation by Evans Pritchard that there could be witches in a secret society, but there's no evidence of this. So when you see, anytime you're looking at any culture, 
accusations of witchcraft, the thing to remember is what you want to look at is not the stuff witches actually do, but counter sorcery, counter witchcraft. What are the rituals that people are doing to address the problem of witchcraft? They'll speculate and tell you all about what witches do, but I would say almost universally, there's no witches out there that are, are actually cursing anyone. What we see is this worldwide trend of accusations. So there may be talk of witches, but there are no witches. There may be talk of witchcraft, but the rituals around witchcraft are about getting rid of witchcraft. Now, India makes it funny, though. Look at all we looked at before, because there you actually have texts that describe these hostile rituals. You'll see in Favrasada later that she could never get a hold of these supposed grimoires that all the witches have. Um, and for all the time Evans Pritchard spent there, he never saw someone who actively called themselves a witch and did witchy stuff. There are no books of spells here like we see in the magic tantras in Africa. We don't see books of spells. You don't see secret grimoires, which we'll talk about in a little while later. Uh, the secret grimoires or spell books in Europe tend to be it's unclear how much people are actually practicing with them. And I would argue that a lot of the writing in grimoires kind of cross-culturally is more about fantasy and imagination. You know how I like to think about fantasy and imagination. So let's use our fantasy and imagination and read about Evans Pritchard and the witchcraft in the Azandi. So what are we going to learn about these people? And, you know, the nice thing is it's an ethnography. So this isn't speculative. Unlike what we were reading before, which were just spells, we are actually getting the report of someone who was there and someone who recorded actual people doing things. Well, among the Azandi, the Azandi are perfectly and happy and healthy in their system of witchcraft. The eruption of chaos in their world is given a reason. When misfortune happens, it's witchcraft that causes it. So you're no longer stuck with why do bad things happen to good people? Why do bad things happen to good people? Because there are witches, because there are evil, jealous people. And what causes a witch to perform witchcraft, to enable and deploy their witchcraft? They deploy their witchcraft out of hatred and jealousy. And there is one thing we can be sure of. No matter where you go around the world, people will be jealous. Jealousy to me seems to be one of the most fundamental human emotions. So when we're looking at Azandi's, the Azandi system of witchcraft, I want you to see how it is a very clear social system. And I want you to think back to Emil Durkheim. Remember how Durkheim said that religion is a mirror of society, or he even he would say society is religion and the aspects of a society you'll actually see mirrored in the religion and vice versa. So there's no escaping the social structure. So witchcraft, in fact, ends up being a theodicy. We might have had that word before. I can't remember. Theodicy comes from two Greek words, theos and dike. So that's God plus justice. Theodicy is the reason for evil and pain in the world. Why bad things happen to good people. Witchcraft theories and speculation on witchcraft are connected widely throughout daily life in the Azandi. They talk about it all the time. Briefly, bad things happen. There's no denying that. But when bad things happen that are particularly bad and particularly suited to an individual, that's witchcraft. Witchcraft is afoot. The funny thing is, I remember I was preparing for this lesson. I want you to remember this example later. And I had, uh, I had four containers, uh, bottles of Diet Pepsi. I put them in my refrigerator the night before. I went to grab one in the morning because I like my soda in the morning. And I opened it up, sh 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 little fuzz, ugh, completely flat. Threw it out. What is this business? Grabbed one then. Psh, oh, made it sound. Ugh, completely, all four of them, completely flat. Now, the first thing I thought was, clearly this is witchery. And we'll see when we're looking at uh, Favrasada's work in the Brocage in rural France, that when a cow suddenly starts giving rotten milk, or the butter spoils too quickly. That's a sign of witchery. But I think some witch is trying to drain me of my vitality by removing the carbonation from my soda. Oddly, the more I think about it, the reduction of carbonation in soda is like getting rid of like a vital quality to a substance, making that substance worthless, sort of like spoiling milk. Witchcraft. Who hates me? Who hates me? Okay. So 
We're talking about theodicy. All right. They give a couple of really great examples here, and these are all pretty darn famous. So in the first example that, uh, that I want to bring up for the Azandi, Evans Pritchard describes a granary. Now, Azandi people would regular, or Zandi or Azandi, Zandi people would regularly in the heat of the day sit under these elevated granaries and hang out. That's common. No problem. And granaries fall all the time. Why would they fall? I don't know. It could be poorly built. Could be overfilled, could be bad weather, could have been a flood, could have been some compromise. Termites could have got into it. There's termites everywhere, as we'll read later. Um, so granaries fall. Now, the granary falling is not witchcraft. But if the granary falls and there's someone under it and they're killed, that's witchcraft. What's the witchcraft of it? That the granary was made to fall? No. The witchcraft is that it fell at that specific time when that specific person was underneath and they specifically were killed. That's the witchcraft aspect of it. So let's say there's this gnarly stump in the middle of a path is another example we read about. You can see this stump in the middle of a path. And there are stumps in lots of paths all over zombie land. And everybody keeps an eye out for it. So there's this, this gnarly stump. It's common. So if one was to trip over the stump as... Uh, Pritchard tells us about a young man who trips over the stump and hurts himself. That's not odd per se. However, if he trips over the stump, hurts himself more than he should, and gets a really bad infection, then the young man will say, it's witchcraft. Why is it witchcraft? Witchcraft. Not that he fell over the stump, but it's that that stump was in that perfect spot for him to be there at that specific time for him to hurt himself and for that wound to not heal, that minor injury or even a somewhat major injury, becoming more life-threatening. That shows that it is witchcraft. Witchcraft. Snake bite, illness are really common. Now, the thing isn't that the witch causes the snake bite or the illness. The witch causes someone to die from it. A normal person who's not afflicted by witchcraft would recover. So in this sense, they would argue that all death has an element of witchcraft to it because there is a malevolence to make that thing lethal. They don't really treat old age, though. That's an interesting problem. Okay, so the Azandi say that there are two spears in every killing, in every death, or in every misfortune. So think about it this way. When you're hunting, there's two spears. One is the spear that kills the animal, that does the damage. The other spear is the intention of the hunter. The Azandi say that there are two spears in every killing of a person or of an animal who is hunted. The first spear does the damage, but the second spear is the intention and the opportunity to kill. In this way, witchcraft is the second spear. Witchcraft isn't that someone has a misfortune. It is that those misfunctions happen particularly to them and they're particularly dangerous. Witchcraft is the intention of the witch that makes the spear lethal not in particular the spear itself. So the second spear is the way they talk about it. And this becomes a common uh, anthropological convention to write about the second spear. So who are these witches? Well, uh, all misfortune, particularly unique misfortune, is thought to be witchcraft. Now, a witch's identity can't just be discerned. You don't just look and see that someone's a witch, though we'll see some nuance on that later. What you have to do is when a person is suffering, they go to an oracle, and there are three types of oracles here, and we're going to look at them and see them in a documentary. There is the rubbing board, the termite or oracle, and the poison oracle. I'll explain them a little bit more. But generally, when you think you're under witchcraft, you go and you consult one of these or oracles, and you say, is it witchcraft? And they go, yeah. And then you do another one. You say, is it this person? And it goes, no. Is it this person? No. Is it this person? Yes. Aha. All right. Now I got to do something. And then they elect to have things they can do to address the witchcraft. So when witchcraft and a witch is diagnosed, there has to be some way to deal with it. But you don't go and beat the guy up or the gal up. That would kind of be really antisocial. So maybe once upon a time, once witches were accused, people would go and kill them. But the zombies are much more sophisticated than that. There are social systems to reprise and address witchcraft without violent retribution. So... First off, the witch might be confronted. You might actually go and talk to them and say, hey, I think you're doing witchcraft. And they'll do a thing where 
they put water in their mouth and they go <laughs> and spit it out and say, whatever witchcraft I have, even if not intentional, may my witchcraft be cool. Like, I, I let me cool down the witchcraft in me and cast that aside. So think about the social structure there. You have someone who you know is jealous or hates you. Bad things are happening to you. You think it's their fault. You assess it via an oracle. And then you go and you say, I think you did this. And they go, hey, cool. Whether I did it or not, whatever. Think about how that makes people more cohesive and binds them together. I like to think that these accusations of witchcraft is like you're building steam in a boiler. That boiler is building up steam, building up steam, that tension between people. And then at some point, when they blow the water out and say, may my witchcraft be cool, that's like you've turned a valve to let the steam out of the boiler so it doesn't explode. In this way, the accused, by being generous and humble, say, I, I didn't know I did that, but hey, all good. They can, they can diffuse the whole situation. So that's really kind of great. They can end the witchcraft by just owning it. So they say, uh, I don't have this quote up here, on page 25, if a man is killed by a spear in war or by a wild beast in hunting or by the bite of a snake or from sickness, witchcraft is the socially relevant cause since it is the only one which allows intervention and determines social behavior. The person has misfortune. The accusation of witchcraft allows somebody to do something. Witchcraft creates meaning in the face of unthinkable and unreasonable suffering. Remember my argument that I make about magic, that one thing that magic really does, whether it's effective or not with the rituals to change the world or not, is it reduces the pain and suffering of inertia. It reduces the feeling of pain at not being able to do anything. So witchcraft just jumps right in here and says, oh, this horrible thing happened. There's a reason for it. Here it is. And then you socially act it out. And you act it out not just with yourself, but with people around you, leading to a greater sense of connection and social cohesion. Witchcraft amongst the Azandi is great. So human social agency enters this system of misfortune and helps make sense of suffering. The witch blowing out the water reconciles the tension among the tribe. They literally clear the air. So a zombie culture, as we see here, has really dissipated. And you can read in the introduction, which I didn't assign, about sort of the state of affairs of the Azandi in the 1970s. When the introduction was wrote, Evans Pritchard was doing research there in the 1920s. So as a result of the changing worlds due to colonialism, the collapse of the colonies in England, and the rise of African nation states, the Azandi were divided and moved about into various sort of locations that are split across a number of now nations. So this shifted them away from a traditional lifestyle in which they lived in small encampments that were seen over by a larger prince or king of an area. So contemporary Zondiland now can be found in the southeast of, centrally, of the Central African Republic, the northeast of the Democratic Republic of the Congo, and the south central and south area of Sudan. So that's where the place is that we're talking about. So Zandi culture is still around, but it's really changed. Through industrialization and a modern economy, the Zandi have sort of shifted from their usual social environment. And folks that have come back and done further research note that the witchcraft has changed as well. So the environment changed, and so do the systems of witchcraft. Remember how Durkheim kept saying that society equals religion? That means that if the society changes, so will the notion of religion. So what about all this stuff with religion and magic? How is this business on witchcraft magic? Well, it is and it isn't. It's kind of related. I want you to kick this around. How is this religious? I mean, it makes sense of the supernatural. It interacts with sort of unseen beings and whatnot. So how is it religion? How is it, how is it magic? I would argue that witchcraft amounts to more counter witchcraft when the magic rituals of witchcraft are used, they're rituals to address witchcraft. So instead of sorcery, it's counter sorcery. In a way, instead of magic, it's anti-magic. It's magic against magic, to remedy magic. Witchcraft functions to make sense of the world in the same way that religion does. Remember Theostike, God and justice, setting out a reason for why bad things happen to good people. 
We're looking at something different in this unit than we were looking at in our last unit on magic rituals. And I want you to keep kind of thinking about how they're all related. So who is Evans Pritchard? I mean, in many ways, he's the founder of social anthropology. And I kind of love this picture here of him hanging out with the tribe. Notice the way he's dressed in Western clothes. Traditionally, the British would try to get as blended into their society they were studying as anthropologists as possible, but still would wear Western dress. I have a sneaking suspicion, though, that they're posing for these pictures, and in their daily lives, they might not wear Western dress. They might be fully integrated. Gone native, if you will, which is a horrible phrase when you really think about it. Okay, so this guy is an anthropologist and an ethnographer. Well, what's ethnography? Ethnography. Graphy, writing about, ethno, people, ethnicities. So ethnography is a part of anthropology. Anthropos, logos, a discourse into the nature of man or culture. Ethnographers use ethnography as a method. Their method they can describe as thick description. Clifford Geertz described that. Or I often hear deep hanging out. They just get into the culture, constantly making notes, trying to record absolutely everything. They're really trying to figure out every aspect of daily life in these cultures, starting with the social and the social structure, but branching out into the ecological, agricultural, economic, and so forth. Their, their main methodology is to write field notes. So they'll go and live abroad, usually for a year in one society, and they just take notes on everything. And they spend the, last, the rest of their career trying to make sense of those field notes. So one of the most important things they do there is they write. The ethnographer is a writer. Evans Pritchard notes that he lived with the Azandi. He lived as they lived in a hut with a spear, doing all the things they would do. This is often called in anthropology participant interaction. So I would like you to remember that Evans Pritchard did his field work in 1926, 1928. So while the British Empire were still in swing and he published his big book uh, on magic and uh, it had the same title, Witchcraft, Oracles and Magic Amongst the Azandi. That was over a thousand pages. In 1977, several years after he died, a condensed version was put out. And that's the one that's become really a huge classic with wide readership. It's very much a piece of world literature at this point. Like I said, he was considered uh, the main founder of social anthropology. He died in 1973. And he was also knighted by the British crown, if you like that kind of thing. So as we're looking at anthropology, remember the beginning of the course when we talked about theology being prescriptive and anthropology being descriptive. And we should, when thinking about religion, try to be more descriptive than prescriptive. The ethnographer does not make any qualitative sort of judgments about the culture, but he seeks to uncover the system of the culture. Now, I must note that anthropology has been used in one case by the U.S. government to decimate a Vietnamese village during the War of Vietnam, has been used to dominate other cultures. As the lore that anthropologists uncover have been used to manipulate and rule over the tribes or groups that those anthropologists set out to study. You never know what's going to happen with your work once you publish it. But Anthropology has also been used to show the incredible complexity and the relativity of human culture, how human cultures are so variable and so different, and how maybe there's not any one right way to be human. Now, this unit on uh, witchcraft has two aspects. Well, it has two big books that we're going to read, in fact. Later in this unit, we're going to see a, syst a different system of witchcraft as recorded in northern rural France in the 1970s by a woman named uh, Jean Favrasada. Uh, her book is published in English called Deadly Words, Witchcraft in the Bossat, in the, in the, in the Brocage, which is sort of northern rural France. And her original uh, title of the book, you'll have to excuse my French, Les, les Mots, Les Morts, Les Sorts, which sounds really nice in French, but the words, the death, the spells, doesn't sound as kind of cool in English. So she, she, she finds that these witchcraft systems amongst the French, uh, these rural French, were ultimately antisocial. The fears of witchcraft ruined lives and accusations of witchcraft also ruined lives. It's a whole system that seems profoundly antisocial as opposed to the Izandi system, which is profoundly social. In fact, Evans Pritchard describes himself comfortably talking about witchcraft all the time. 
living out there and he'd be like ah oh, this thing went bad gotta be witchcraft and they'd be like who hates you and they go off and do the witchcraft thing and yeah he really got into it and he was like yeah you know what this all kind of makes sense you might find yourself thinking that it makes sense so favre Sada, on the other hand was in the 1970s she set herself up in france and began uh interviewing people who were bewitched and people who would go around and would be what she would call anti-witchers people that would get rid of the witchcraft and what she found is just that it was just it was bad it was bad news bears all around and she found that she started being integrated into the system and people wanted her to become an anti-witcher, someone that would get rid of witchcraft. Around the same time, she got really ill and started having a number of surprising and unexpected car accidents. All of these things were declared witchcraft by her informants. And at some point she got so freaked out, she like left. She, she had to go back to Paris for like eight months. And then she came back later and, and finished her research to create this incredible book. Um, as we get to it, you'll see it's probably one of the most difficultly written books. And I consistently ask students, should I keep teaching this? And they start with no. And then once we get through, the ones that struggle with the most go, okay, wait, no, 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 this is really good. This is really cool. You'll see why. Okay, so now to go through some details of witchcraft. So witchcraft is thought to be a physical substance. This physical substance is inside people. They say it's attached to the edge of a liver. And when people cut open the belly, they uh, have only to pierce it, the belly or the witchcraft substance or this little this little black thing in the body. And the witchcraft substance are these funky, like dirty hairs, broken nails or whatnot will burst through with a pop, which sounds really cool. In fact, it's thought to be sort of a blackish oval in the body filled with witchcrafty items. We'll get into that a little later and witchcraft darts and whatnot. Um. It cannot be found in autopsy. And in fact, there have been instances of people being autopsied after they died, searching for the witchcraft substance. And when it was not found, and then, then they were declared innocent. So that's intriguing. Um, and there are some sort of instances that Evans Pritchard heard about of people actually finding the witchcraft substance in someone. The one thing that you need to understand is that the only way to really prove someone is a witch is if they are repeatedly accused and the oracles affirm that they're a witch. If there's a pattern, that pattern of witchcraft creates the, the knowledge, the stayed knowledge that someone is a witch. Now, not all people that have the witchcraft organ are in fact witches. So in order to be a witch and, and do witchcraft, you have to be born with the witchcraft thing in your body, but it has to be activated and deployed, usually by your own hatred and jealousy. Now, there's a lot of discussion about how many people who have the witchery in them, just they don't have the hatred or the jealousy or the desire. So it remains cool. It remains cool. It doesn't heat up and go intense. And remember, what is the way to, to get rid of the witchcraft? Blow water, cooling water out of your mouth. So when it becomes hot, it deploys and it's bad. So for witch to operate, they must have the jealousy and hatred and the desires to harm others, as well as this inborn substance. Countering witchcraft, as we'll see, involves cooling that substance. We do see that young people do not get accused of witches. And if they are, usually they'll say that some older witch has put the young person in front of them to disguise their behavior. The youth are never thought to be witches because they're not old enough. Uh, they're not old enough to have the hatred and jealousy needed. And the, that witchcraft substance in their body hasn't matured enough to really get going. So older people are the ones most afraid, uh, the people are most afraid of being witches. That witch substance emanates outside of the body. That witch substance moves out of the body and goes to the person that's the victim and steadily drains them of their life force, causing more and more misfortunes upon them. So in this slow decline from ill health or poverty or repeated misfortunes is a sign of witchcraft. And we see this worldwide. We'll see specifically with uh, Deadly Words that this manipulation of a sort of life essence or life force will be really important there. So the witchcraft is, the witchcraft substance is physical, but its power is psychic. So the witch substance is thought to travel through the air, invisible by day, except to other witches can see it. Uh, and then there's this great phrase. I forgot the page uh, that it's on. It says, uh, witchcraft is like fire. 
It lights a light. It's thought to be light moving around in the dark. I think this is fascinating. Evans Pritchard tells this great story about how he's writing up his field notes. He's hanging out one evening. And he just and he hears a racket or something. He just gets alerted and he looks up and he sees this floating fire go by at a distance. And he's like, witchcraft? Who knows? So he grabs his spear, throws his throws his like cloak on, and goes out to investigate. So he couldn't find anyone there. Um, but he does notice that the direction that the, the light was traveling go, went directly to a place where a person was later accused of, or, or to a person who was later uh, diagnosed as being afflicted by witchcraft. And I think who died. So he's like, well, I don't know what that was, but that's kind of uncanny for a coincidence. Likely, he argues, it could have been somebody who had lighted a clump of grass and was using that like a flashlight, like a torch, kind of walking through the night. But he continues to argue that he did see it going in the direction of where the witchery was occurring. So that's an interesting and undeniable correspondence. I would argue it's probably somebody walking at night, but you can see how this type of lore can be supported and enhanced by a material event. Namely, you know witchcraft has been afoot over there. You look outside, you see a moving light, you go out and you can't find anybody there. What are you gonna assume? I mean, you could be materialistic, or you think, no, oh, that could be witchcraft. Anyway, we will see that generally unpleasant people and generally unpleasant older people are often described uh, are often described and accused of being witches. Cantankerous behavior, just in general, demonstrates jealousy, making people who are cantankerous and unpleasant easy targets for witchcraft accusation. So once again, witchcraft accusations and the fear of being accused of witch makes you behave better. This is a good thing. We could use a little bit more about people, you know, being nicer to one another, more magnanimous, or maybe just not so critical because they were worried that people would think they're witches. Now, I came up with this idea in a class one time. We have this phrase, resting bitch face, which is a phrase we say all the time about, like, usually a woman or a man who just, you know, when you look at them, they've got that, that look. I, I definitely have pals who have this. They're delightful people. They just have resting bitch face. What are you going to do? What about resting witch face? Generally, I would bring this up when I teach this class in person and we joke about resting witch, witch face for the rest of the class. At one point, I think I was thinking about somebody, something in front of the class and the student's like, resting witch face? And I'm like, oh man, you got me. All right, so there's this social function. Negative, nasty people are punished. They are, and positive people are encouraged, generally rewarded by not being stuck in a system of accusations. You don't wanna be accused of a witch? Be a decent, generous person. Evans Pritchard does note that there are some people he's met who have been consistently accused of being witches that gives them a sort of prestige because they're so cantankerous and so witch-like that nobody wants to cross them because even if you disrespect them or get in their way, you're just walking into a witchcraft infestation. Now, as I said, the old, the elderly are considered the most potent witches. So... Pritchard describes how a young man who has great success in hunting will send food to all of the elders living near him, making sure to distribute the food fairly and not to slight anyone. Again, the witchcraft system <laughs> sets up care for the elderly. Sure, you're not caring out of an altruistic love for, you know, older people, but maybe you keep an eye on them and make sure they're doing okay so they don't witch you. That's not a bad thing. Maybe again in our culture, if we were afraid that if we treated old people poorly, they might witch us, maybe we'd treat people better. I don't know. I think I'm a witch. I'm a witchcraft apologist when it comes to Evans Pritchard. All right. So witchcraft and misfortune. Hold on a second here. We're rolling in toward the end. Witchcraft is a pervasive system. It's talked about in common conversation by the young, by the old. Pritch Evans Pritchard said he was able to figure it out pretty quickly because it was just such a common thing. They wouldn't describe, like you couldn't say, what is witchcraft? They'd be like, what are you talking about? Or to explain a whole system of how it works, how it operates. They wouldn't have any of that. It's just, it's just a thing. It's sort of like uh, in India, if you're a Hindu, for instance, you're living in a Hindu area, you don't think of yourself as a Hindu. You just think of, this is how I live. This is my whole system. I go to the, I go to the temple every day. I do these specific rituals. This is just what I do. I don't think of these things as religion. They're just a part of life. It takes a scholar wandering by to uh, say, oh no, that's religion. 
One famous professor of religious studies, the great Jay-Z Smith, who I've mentioned before, said that there is no such thing as religion. Religion is the product of a scholar's mind sitting in his office thinking. Because we don't have a category of religion. We just have stuff we do. Now, in the United States, we think about the different poles of secular and religious, religious and non-religious. But in reality, worldwide, people don't think about that. It takes somebody looking at a culture and trying to extract parts to separate out religion from common life. And that's where you start seeing people able to observe religion. All right. In which, in the Azandi culture, witchcraft is that second sphere. The causation. Witchcraft is the causation. So a material thing happens. You know, you get hit by a car. But the witchcraft explains how you were at the very right spot, and that other car was at the very right spot for them to come together at the exact same time in order for the injury to occur. I was just in a really terrible accident really recently, and I've thought about this a lot. How was I able to be on the road at that exact same time, and the guy that hit and ran me at the exact same time, and then come through the intersection at the exact same time for that to happen? I could have turned right. I probably should have turned right because I was getting kind of lost going where I was going. And that guy could have stopped and not blown through uh, taking a left on green. What is it that made that specific thing happen? Witchcraft. All right. So witchcraft is that second spear, what I, which I was saying before. It's the causation behind the material events. So he writes, uh, Evans Pritchard writes about an informant who accidentally lights his beer hut that he's very proud of on fire. And he's like, it's witchcraft. And Evans Pritchard was like, no, you set it on fire because you were in there in the dark. You put up, some, you set a thing on flame to check on something. You set the thatch on fire. He's like, no, no, witchcraft. Why was it witchcraft? Because he had not, he had gone that one particular night and not another night. And then he had held that burning clump at just the right angle instead of holding it low to set it on fire. The material thing of burning the hut down is real, but it was the witchcraft that caused it to really happen. Or you have a potter who uh, is very skilled usually, but um, he sees his pot explodes in the kiln when he's firing it. But he looks and he sees that there's a little pebble that he didn't get out of the, out of the clay. And he goes, ah, that's not witchcraft. That's just, I screwed up. But when a skilled artisan has a project that fails despite perfect technique, that is witchcraft. Witchcraft is almost like a, a, a catalyzing element in a long chain of causation. In another example, uh, Evans Pritchard says, a man kills himself, and it's said that he died by witchcraft. Sure, it's suicide. He actually killed himself. But the witchery accounts for it. See, he would have recovered from any pains or illnesses or tribulations or adulteries. He would have been fine with the sadness. He would have got better. But the witchery, the witchcraft, made it, made it lethal. So on page 24, witchcraft explains why events are harmful to man, not how they happen. So where do you find witches? Well, you seek them. Well, they're all around you. You're looking for your enemies that are close. This is a system in which people are living very much enmeshed, all up in everybody's business. It'd be a community. I mean, they're all the same tribesmen, but you'd have like six families living together. And then like from a distance, there'd be other groups that are all ruled over by the prince. So people know each other pretty well. Proper vengeance for witchcraft is required if it is lethal. And this is usually carried out by a ruling prince after extensive consultation with the oracle. So on the occasion that a witch is killed for being a witch, which hasn't happened in a very, very long time, it would be because there was extensive investigation. There's a greater, clearer system for addressing witchcraft. First off, a person may go up to another person and say, hey, back off, witch. And for the most part, they don't like have a direct intervention. They can make an open statement that this person I accuse has doing witchcraft against me. I ask that they stop. But there's no like big open quarrel between them. Now, if the witchcraft continues, then there's another element. This whole system that we describe is going to put the witch in a good and gracious mood. So you're saying this person has done witchcraft to me. That means they hate me. That means they're jealous of me. So one of the first things you do is you make them feel better and you give them a way to express that they might have been hatred, but they're going to let it all go. This creates social cohesion. So in another system, we have the poison oracle, oracle and blowing water that I talked about. 
So a poison oracle involves giving a specific amount of poison to a bird and asking the oracle of the poison if the person if a specific person is a witch. If the bird dies, it's true. If the bird doesn't die, it's not. If the bird dies, then they know who the witch is and they kill the bird. They cut well, the bird is already dead. They cut the wing off the bird and then they find somebody, some emissary to take that wing of the bird over to the accused witch and say, hey, um, you're accused of witchcraft. And the accused, and this is considered very good manners, will graciously say, oh my goodness, let me put water in my mouth and spit it all over the place and say, I, I didn't know I was doing witchcraft. Whatever witchcraft that I have committed, even unintentionally, let it be cooled, let it be cooled, let everybody be cool. So, they do that. They blow the water over the wing. It's thought that the witchery has gone into the wing. Then it's blown out through the blowing of the water. It's a pretty cool system. So, um, like I said before, there might be an initial declaration that a person is a witch, asking and asking them to voluntarily before the oracle and before the wing and whatnot that they actively, like formally, just blow the water in the first place and call it good. But if the witchcraft continues, then you have to go with the oracle in this way. Remember that all of this is happening in a smallish encampment of a few families united in a common tribe. Should that public declaration not be effective and the witchcraft continues, then they must proceed to convince the witch to blow water. But all of these people are enmeshed. All of this is a web of social interactions. And witchcraft comes in as a way to explain and also to mediate social tensions. All right. To a zandi, almost every happening which is harmful to him is due to the evil disposition of someone else who hates you. What is bad for him is morally bad. That is to say, it derives from an evil man. Any misfortune evokes the notion of injury and desire for retaliation. For all loss is deemed by a zandi to be due to witches. To them, death, whatever its occasion, is murder and cries out for vengeance. Remember had to have witchcraft to really kill somebody. For even, uh, uh, for the even, or well, what am I at? For, uh, even, blah, blah, blah. for the event or situation of death is to them the important thing and not the instrument by which it was caused, be it a disease or a wild spear or it's the spear of an enemy. Regardless of what killed them, it was the witchcraft behind it that caused it to be lethal. All right, so that's witchcraft. We're gonna do a lot more with this witchcraft amongst these zombies. What are our takeaways? Witchcraft is a social corrective system. Misfortune is explained based on social tensions of enmeshed tribesmen. When I say enmeshed, I mean they are together, socially, cohesively, emotionally enmeshed. Witchcraft is logical. It is coherent. It is as reasonable as any Western theodicy. How's this any different from a demon did it, a devil did it, whatever, an angel helped me, blah, blah, blah. Um, it's pro-social. That's the thing that's really interesting to me. In this system, it is pro-social. It supports people and social institutions, but it does not in other cultures. Hold on, I'm getting something right at the end. So it's pro-social. Elsewhere, it's kind of anti-social. We're going to see this in France. So it's a system of accusations about people doing witchery, explaining things, rather than a documentation of anything in particular that witches supposedly do with rituals. Actually, in fact, there are no witches. I'll continually argue that as we move through. All right. Uh, I hope you're excited about it. I'm pumped to be uh, talking about this. This material is really fun. All right. I'll talk to you next time. Bye-bye.